Hi, Cameron Knight here again with another fantastic camera overview for you. Today we are looking at the infamous and well-loved Raleigh 35. Um, this is a specific version. There are many, many versions of these. Um, like in our other videos, we're going to talk about the different models that were made of these, um, the types of lenses that came with them since they don't have interchangeable lenses, and um, the history, how I got the camera, how it works, how it functions, and my general impressions of it. So let's go ahead and get started. This camera debuted at Photokina in 1966. It was originally, well, it was des designed by Heinz Wasaki. Maybe that's his last name. It's really hard to pronounce. It has two A's next to each other for no reason. Um, he presented it to um, Wurgen, which is, I'm assuming is another pronunciation. It's an old camera company. I've seen the name. I've never actually heard it pronounced, but um, he presented it to them, and they just they were shutting down their camera manufacturing t at that time. So um, he then went to Kodak, and they also turned it down, and then he also um, finally wound up presenting it to Raleigh, and they came on board and, and started manufacturing them. Raleigh is known for their twin lens cameras. Um, as you probably know, uh, they're based in Germany. They've made um, rangefinder cameras, SLR cameras, um, these, a bunch of other cameras. They've, they're just an all around general camera maker, which these days is now um, mainly, they're mo most famous for their twin lens reflex cameras. So I bought this camera um, after I got my first job and I bought it at a camera swap. And if you've never been to a camera swap, you should really go. Um, they happen in a lot of different places. They're not as common as they used to be, but um, where I live, I live in a pretty big city, and um, we still have camera swaps, I believe, two or three times a year, and um, the vast majority of the stuff that you'll find there is vintage, um, because that's what is hard to find. If it were easy to find, you wouldn't need to have, like, organized camera swaps and able to find stuff. I bought it there. I believe I spent quite a bit of money on this. Um, I think I bought it for like $200, um, all things considered. I did a little bit of trading for it and stuff too. Um, but I really, really, really wanted one. So um, I, money at that point was pretty much no object. So I, I found one and I bought it. Um, you can find them on KEH. You can find them on eBay. Um, this is sort of not the most basic model, but pretty close. And um, you, they make like even better ones of these. So um, you can just check it out and see which one kind of fits with your, uh, you know, desires the most. But, um, yeah, that's how I ended up getting this is at my, uh, my first camera swap with a job. So it was really fun. And this is one of my favorite cameras. Um, I really got into non SLR cameras after a while. Um, when you're a camera nut like me, SLRs get really boring really fast. Um, so as much as I shoot with a, SLR, when I'm working, I shoot with an SLR every day. Um, that's, what I, that's what I work with. So when I started looking into using different types of cameras and especially different types of film cameras, I really got kind of bored with the SLR really quick. So um, you've seen my range, the last video was about a rangefinder. Um, that was also a symptom of just being bored with, um, yeah, being bored with SLRs. Um, so I went to, to this camera because it's just totally weird and unexpectedly weird. Like you just, it's crazy how much of a cult following this camera has and how freaking bizarre it is. So I just want to run through a few of the models really quick. Um, so the original camera that they came out with was a Raleigh 35. The nameplate, which you'll see right here, um, the first ones all looked similar to this. They came black like this and they also came in a chrome and black i believe um, and they've actually released dozens of different kinds of these as like commemorative editions and stuff like that so you can get them in like gold and platinum and all kinds of different materials but um, this was one of the early releases um, probably in the early 70s but it was not the first run and you can tell that very easily by looking at the back because it says made by raleigh singapore the original cameras were made in germany and they will say germany right there on the back and it's really easy to tell if you have a Singapore camera because it'll say Singapore on the back the problem is you're you're never quite sure if you have a Germany camera because this whole back section is removable from the camera so 
when a German camera broke down, a lot of times they would just take the back off of it because it has no moving parts or anything really important on it. They usually always function. Um, they would take that back portion off and just put it on a single bore camera and sell it for two or three times the price. In my research, and granted, I've only used this one, Raleigh 35, um, from, from what I've heard from other people who are users of these and are really passionate about them, the quality is negligibly different. Um, most people would never be able to tell unless you're doing like hardcore camera testing where you're running, you know, 50,000 frames through a camera a year or you're, um, you know, whatever. Um, and most of the Singapore ones will hold up just as well. But I mean, as with anything that's not produced um, in the origin country, there's always the few and far between quality control issues. But um, I have not really ever heard anything bad about the Singapore Rally 35s, it's just that these are collectible cameras. Um, unlike a, a Zorky, perhaps, that's maybe not as collectible, this is actually collectible. People buy this and then put it on a shelf and never use it and then sell it for much more money later. So um, the Germany ones are just more collectible. That's why they go for more money. So um, the other thing I want to talk about a little bit is just the later models that came after this. So you have the, the Raleigh 35S and the Raleigh 35T. Both of those were kind of different versions of like the next generation of camera. Um, then you have the Raleigh 35SE and the Raleigh 35TE. The S and the T are lens designations. So if you see one with an S, you know it has a sonar lens, uh, which is a German design lens. Uh, the S and the SE both, have, both are 40 millimeter 2.8 uh, sonar lenses. And the Raleigh 35, the Raleigh 35T, and the Raleigh 35TE are all Tessar lenses, and I believe they're all F35 lenses. Um, but they're all 40 millimeter lenses. If I can take the, my filter off here, you can see that this is a Tessar lens. Let's see how close my new SLR will focus here. So you can see that it's a Tessar 40, stands for 40 millimeter, and 3,5, stands for 3.5 aperture. And then you can see made in Raleigh on the other side there. So, um, so that's kind of the different variations, and that you can easily be found, uh, just distinguished by the, 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 letter that, the letters or letter that comes after this. So the uh, SE and the TE have a little bit better metering system, well, more easy to use metering system. And uh, the T and the E are just the kind of updated versions. Um, they weren't able to get the sonar lens ready for this camera um, fast enough for the release, as far as I know. So they ended up releasing the next model with a, with a sonar variant. Um, these first models also came with a S, Xenar lens, uh, that's X-E-N-E-R, I believe it's pronounced Xenar, and those were made by Schneider. Um, in terms of these first versions that have the Tessar or the, or the Xenar, um, the Tessar is considered the better camera and the Xenar is considered the cheaper lensed version of this camera. So just something to keep in mind when you're thinking about the variants. There's a lot of different kinds. They basically all look the same. Um, there were beginner models is what they called them that didn't have these dials. Uh, these dials, which I'll talk about later, are for the aperture and the shutter speed. Um, these dials were removed and this faceplate is blank along the side. And then all of the shutter speed and aperture stuff was moved along this lens barrel. Um, and uh, the metering system, which is up here, was inside. So they made these basic models that looked slightly different than these because these two dials weren't in the front. Um, but they still have all the same functionality. It's just um, maybe the components weren't as good, or they were they just not marketed uh, to the same degree that the original uh, 35 was. So um, just all the different variants, they're all basically the same functionality and the same uh, ability. They just um, look a little bit different. So they're, but basically what I'm trying to say is that there are a lot of different kinds of these, and pretty much anyone you'll find is going to be pretty good. Um, but the Germany ones from the beginning, these, these Raleigh 35 from Germany, are probably the most desirable. And then the Raleigh 35 SE is probably the most advanced. And um, if you're going to use it, probably the most user-friendly. These are not the most user-friendly cameras, but I will get to that in a little bit. So next, I want to talk about kind of how these came about. 
So the Rally 35 is arguably, and it's a big debate online and just over history, arguably uh, at the time the smallest full frame 35 millimeter camera to be to exist. Um, it's debatable because obviously this is all metal, which is really nice. Um, so there were some that are lighter. Uh, the Minix 35 um, was a scale focus camera, same kind of controls. It was, uh, I think most of them were aperture priority at least, um, and not completely manual, but they were a competitor. But basically all these small full frame 35 millimeter cameras came out um, in response to smaller format cameras. So you have the 16 millimeter cameras that came out. This is an example of that. This is a Minolta 16, which you can see right there. Uh, cool little spy camera design. Um, you know, this is the viewfinder here, look through there, and then this is the lens. Um, fully manual controls here, which is really cool. Um, you have your f-stops and your shutter speeds right there. Um, you have your shutter uh, here. And then um, these, these are actually like filters that pop off. And that's how you uh, would f kind of control the focus. Um, it was a fixed focus camera, but you can change out these little filters and it would make it maybe focus at infinity or focus further up. Obviously these spy type cameras, initially uh, the Minix versions were all designed to shoot documents. So they were designed to be used close up. So the 16 millimeter cameras, obviously uh, this is much smaller than this. Um, you can see them side by side. So much smaller, um, maybe better than an SLR or even a Leica rangefinder or something, but still not really a competitor. And then the other thing is half frame cameras. The main, um, the main maker of the most famous production model of a half frame camera was the Olympus Pen, which they actually, Olympus actually rebranded or used that brand name again to make the, uh, the their new four thirds um, you know, mirrorless cameras, but they were originally half frame cameras, which meant that instead of using the full size of a 35 millimeter frame, they used just half of it, which is actually what the APS sensor is based on. So you can see here, this is a half frame camera and you can see here that this looks similar to what a 35 millimeter would be, but you have this much smaller mask over it. The film goes across this way. Normally we get horizontal frames. Um, but this would be vertical in that position. So many of the cameras were oriented this way. So you still get that horizontal look, but it only used half the, the image size on the film. So you get more per frame and the cameras could be made slightly smaller because the lenses could be smaller because they didn't have to cover as much. This is an example of half frame camera, really funky. Um, this is a Bell and Howell, but actually Canon also had this camera uh, branded, just the same model, but branded as Canon. And uh, just a really weird camera, like you wind it up and then you can take a bunch of pictures in a row, almost like a Leningrad, if you're familiar with the Leningrad. So um, funky, weird half frame camera. And if you look, this is actually very size similar. So you can look here, they're roughly the same size. This actually hasn't beat by quite a bit, but they did make some pretty small half frame cameras. The Olympus pen cameras were smaller than SLRs, but they were um, about the same size as a rangefinder. They really weren't that small. Um, they were definitely not as small as this. So um, that's just kind of what was around. I talked a little bit about the Minix 35, which is arguably smaller than this. The other big argument for this camera um, in terms of size is the uh, uh, Olympus XA. Uh, this is an Olympus XA, which is actually a rangefinder, a real legit rangefinder, um, but it's also full frame. It uses a 35 millimeter lens. Anyway, just, I don't want to talk about it too much, but this is arguably smaller. If you want to talk about the argument of whether this is the smallest full frame camera ever made or whatever. Um, but so uh, just another option. And then uh, what came after this is basically a glut in the eighties of in the eighties and nineties of really small cameras that were built to shoot full frame 35 millimeter film. Uh, arguably, this is the most cult and uh, you know most used and loved is the Olympics Olympus Stylus. Uh, this is the American release in Japan, or um, I believe where they they was released. They were called I believe it's pronounced Muji, but it's just M J U. Um, 
was the name of it in wherever it was re originally released. And these are just really small um, cameras. You can see this is the Olympus. Um, if you look at the clamshell design of the XA, you can see that it slides open. And that obviously led to their actual clamshell design of these, which slide open. Um, really desirable cameras. Again, a 35 millimeter. This is a 3.5, so that's kind of um, very similar to the lens of this. But anyway, so that's kind of what the precursor to all these really small pocket cameras from the 90s and the 80s. This is the, the OG, you know, this is the first first big man on campus. Um, and also, I want to throw in, just because, you know, you know how I am, I'm comprehensive. There's also this bad boy, which is the Lomo. Look a little bit similar, huh? About the same size, same texture even a little bit. Um, fixed lens, so same kind of thing, 35 millimeter. Uh, there were a lot of these cameras, a lot of these uh, slightly wide angle uh, scale focus, scale focus kind of things. I'll talk about the focusing system after a while, but um, this this was kind of the pinnacle of the small camera, with the exception of XA, arguably. Um, the 35 is just the cult of these like small fixed lens um, view cameras or viewfinder cameras is what we would call them because there's no um, verification of the focusing system unlike a rangefinder or an SLR. So anyway, uh, that's kind of just some cameras that are like it, <laughs> I guess. Um, but none of them really compare to the quality, uh, the build quality of these and the just the hardcore reliability. These last forever. They're made like a tank. So, But I'll talk about all that later. Uh, XAs. I actually have two XAs. Um, this one's broke. It just didn't work. It sucks. Um, a lot of these just don't work. They get gummed up. Um, they just don't work right. So you sometimes have to buy three or four of these to get one that really works well. And uh, you don't always have to buy one of these. So uh, let's move on from kind of the, what else was around um, and talk about just the general impressions of the camera, which I've touched on already. So um, it's, it's built like a tank, right? It's just, it's super tough. It's fun to shoot. It's funky, right? So I have the filter on here, which is just, uh, you know, just to protect the lens. On fixed lens cameras, it's always nice to have a filter. And I also have another accessory on here, which is not uh, super, doesn't like come with the camera. And it's this uh, soft touch, soft release here. So I'll take that off too. So those are the two um, accessories, I guess I would call this. So this is actually pretty flush. Like if you look at it now, it's pretty low profile along here. It's just that this is kind of hard to hard to get in at sometimes, and it's kind of mushy. So I just put that soft release on there, and it really makes it easier to shoot. So if you're into soft touch or if you care a lot about how the shutter feels, um, then you might want to look into getting that. I love it. I've shot with this a lot. It shoots great pictures. Um, it's just really, really fun. Um, it's super small, so you just throw it in your pocket. It is a little heavy because it's just metal and uh, glass, you know, so, but it's super fun to shoot. You don't think a lot about it. You just set the, set the exposure. It has a built-in meter, so that's really nice. Um, so it's just a one package kind of thing. You don't have to carry a meter with you or bust out your phone or something when you're taking pictures. So it's just something that's really fun to use. And um, I just, I love it. The pictures that I get out of it are surprisingly sharp. The 40 millimeter view that this has, a little bit tighter than a 35, which a lot of times I feel is like a little bit wide, and uh, but also a little bit wider than a 50, which some people find um, a little too tight. So it's kind of an in the middle thing. And if you know anything about uh, the normal lens, um, that's uh, it's supposed to be the diagonal of the of the film of the sensor or whatever. Um, so if you actually take a 35 millimeter frame and you measure across the diagonal, it's 43 millimeters, I believe. And this is right in that wheelhouse. Um, so it's pretty close to that normal. Um, so what else? It's, it's just funky. It's, it's weird. It's whatever. So let me talk a little bit about kind of the quirks and the nature of, uh, nature of the beast here a little bit. So the first thing that you'll notice when you buy one is that it is a collapsible lens camera. Let me see if I can actually, oops, it has to be cocked. Let me cock it for you. You push this button in on the top and you twist it, 
twist it this way, and then it drops right into the camera. Now, it doesn't lock in, um, so if you're carrying it around, it will kind of sometimes shake out a little bit. Um, but it comes with the, then most of the time you'll find them with cases or you can find cases really easily for them. And, um, that kind of keeps the lens in, but when you're just carrying it around, like out, if you're taking pictures, you know, like at a park or whatever, um, you just carry it with the lens out and then it's not a, it's not an issue. Right. So that makes it pretty easy to, to handle. And, um, you don't really have to worry about, I've never had any issues with this getting dirty or anything. So, um, I just leave it out when I'm shooting with it. So um, this, these dials right here, let's again test the close focusing ability of my camera. Let's go even closer. Okay. So you can see here that this is the f-stop dial, which only turns one way. <laughs> you can stop down um, just by turning it, but you have to push in this little thing right here to get it to go the other way. So I don't know why it's like that. I don't know if it's just a simple locking mechanism or whatever, but um, so F35, um, you can stop down as much as you need to, and then you can open up just by pushing in this bottom thing here, this little metal thing, and moving it around. Other side, you have the shutter speeds. You, these you can move back and forth, no problem. Um, there's no release or anything. Um, so you can go down to 15, keep going. You can go down to half a second or bulb all the way up to 500th of a second, which is pretty good. Um, that's pretty much all you'll need in terms of uh, a bright day or whatever, controlling everything. Uh, focusing is done right here. We'll talk about scale focusing in more in a minute. You have a depth of field scale, which is nice. Um, so let's talk about the viewfinder. Um, let's see if we can get you a look in the viewfinder here. So here's the viewfinder. It's really not easy to look through um, on this camera, but you can see a couple little bright lines there um, at the top of the frame. So you see the little notch at the top that's in a little bit. That's the close focusing mark to reframe. Um, there's just a bright line viewfinder. It's really easy to see with glasses. I've never had any problems with that. Again, you're not trying to focus through it or anything, so that makes it, um, you're just framing up with it. And it's relatively accurate. Um, I've never been, like, super shocked by, like, getting a bad, like, framing or anything like that. Um, so let me talk about the meter a little bit. So it actually does have an onboard meter. This over here, this little circle right here, if you can see it, that's the meter. Uh, that's what, um, that's like a, a regular CCD meter or whatever it's called. Uh, it's not selenium, so that's really nice, so they actually do work, but they do require a battery, and I'll talk about the battery later, the battery is a huge pain in the butt, but it's not, um, you know, it's not a deal breaker or anything. So you have your little, uh, your little thing there that's a meter, but the, to read the meter, you go up top, um, which is this, let's test it again, get that close focusing going on. So, is it just too dark in here altogether? I ruined the meter. Is it out of gas here? Okay, so here's the meter. Uh, there's a white uh, line. It's just too dark in this room for it to pop up, but it comes from this side over here, and it's just a white needle that moves with the light. And then this orange circle thingy, whatever you want to call it, uh, moves with the meter. So, um, you know, you just have to match the orange up to the white when the white's out and you'll be good to go. So you can tell that both, uh, both dials move the meter um, in the appropriate direction and in the appropriate, uh, the appropriate amount to kind of match up with whatever the lighting system is. So that's really cool. Um, the only problem is it's not super easy to, uh, to get a good meter reading. Like it's not like an SLR where you just look through the viewfinder and then you have a meter reading. Um, you actually have to take your camera away from your eye and then you match up the stuff with these two. I mean, it's a two-hand operation, right? It's not anything super easy. Um, you get it matched up, and then uh, you go to town. But as I mentioned with uh, stop-down metering and some meterless cameras that I've reviewed, uh, this isn't a deal-breaker. Most of the time, you don't need to be adjusting your, especially with film, you don't have to be adjusting your exposure a third of a stop here and, and half a stop here. You meter for the situation then you shoot till the light changes, or you, you know, if you decide to change from exposing for the shadows to exposing for the highlights, that's when you change. 
you don't really have to be paying attention to your meter every little second. You just have to kind of know what you're shooting for and, and just meter for it. And then you shoot for it. And then if the situation changes, the light changes, then change your meter. So it's not as big of a pain in the butt as it would seem. But uh, regardless, there you go. That's, uh, that's how the meter works. Um, and the battery, it's battery dependent for the meter, but not for this. So if you want to use a handheld meter and you don't want to rely on this little job, uh, you can use a handheld meter and just adjust it manually. Don't even have to keep the battery in the thing. Cock it, shoot, cock it, shoot. So, so I talked about the durability a little bit. Um, I have never had any problems with this camera that have made me stop shooting it. Um, the only problem that I've noticed is a frame spacing issue. And what I mean by that is when you're shooting film um, with this camera, with this particular, uh, this actual camera, not just, not a Raleigh 35, but this camera, um, it has some frame spacing issues. So I have to be really careful when I wind the film, because see how sometimes it slips like that? I have to make sure I get it all the way there and then let it go. And then there'll be proper frame spacing. But a lot of times, because it's like an awkward thing to like do, because um, it's on the wrong side, which we'll talk about in a little bit. Um, sometimes it slips early, and I can't wind anymore. So it's just it's just a weird thing, and um, sometimes my frames butt up against each other instead of being a little bit separated. Um, not a huge deal, and 98% of the time it uh, doesn't cause any problems, but it's that one picture where you're like, man, this is hard to get cut in between, or whatever you're trying to do with your negative. So that's the only problem I've had with it. Um, the meters die sometimes. They're super durable cameras. They're Raleigh's. They're, they're, you know, like the German design. They're tough little cameras. They're metal. This one has some, like, brassing on the side here, you can see. Um, it has a little dent somewhere on the side or something. Um, you can only see it sometimes. But it's like this is a, built like a tank, you know? So you don't really have to worry about that too much, the durability issue. Um, also, unless there's some catastrophic problem, um, you can buy these pretty confidently online used and not worry about, oh, I don't know if it's going to work just right or whatever. It's not like buying a Russian rangefinder um, where you're like, oh, man, I'm going to have to buy three of these to get them to work right. Or the XA, like I mentioned. Um, you can pretty much buy one Raleigh, and if it works, it'll last you for the rest of your life. So I want to talk a little bit about some of the quirks. So it's scale focusing, which I'm going to talk about later. Um, but there's a lot of the controls are a little bit weird. Um, so this is on the wrong side, right? So like a bunch of other cameras that have thumb advance winding, they're all on this side. So that's really strange. You just have to get used to it. Um, the reason why it's over here on a lot of cameras is that it's so you can keep your, your face up to the camera, right? It's so you can wind, keep your eye up here, wind, click, wind, click without leaving the viewfinder. With this camera, obviously, not, you have to move your eye away from the viewfinder or your thumb will pass through it. So one little weird thing that you have to deal with, but you'll get used to it. Um, and this isn't like a sports camera anyway, so I've never found myself like angry that I can't take like five frames a second with it. Um, it's just kind of the nature of the beast. The collapsible lens thing is a little bit weird, so um, you gotta make sure it's wound, obviously. Uh, collapsible lens thing, kind of strange, but it makes it nice to throw in your pocket. It really makes it fit in your pocket really nice. Um, this is the really weird thing right there that job right freaking there what is that that's a hot shoe what the heck is it doing on the bottom of the camera what am i going to do with it there so i either have to have um use it like this and have the flash coming out the bottom and have like spooky ghost ghost story lighting on my guy so he looks like he's a serial killer or i gotta flip my camera upside down which isn't actually a huge deal and use it this way which is just crazy right like why why is it like that the later models uh the one like the se and all that stuff um i think have that moved but i'm not i'm not positive but um they may have corrected that later on so just kind of some funky stuff so i want to quickly talk about the battery a little bit so if you open this up you use this lever right here to open up the back slide it um, the battery, you can see, goes up in there, up in there. 
Um, so use a quarter or a nickel. I think a nickel actually works better than a quarter, uh, but I could be wrong. Um, and the battery goes in there. The thing is, is that they used mercury batteries, at least the early ones did. So you can't get them anymore. They're 1.3 volt batteries, which were super common back in the day, but are useless now because every battery made is 1.5 volt. So what you have to do is you have to buy a battery adapter. Um, there are other ways to like mess with it or whatever, but the easiest way I found and the, the most reliable way I found is to buy a battery adapter. And what that does is these old mercury batteries were big. Um, and they, so they took up a lot of space. So what you do is you use a smaller um, silver whatever kind of battery like you would get for a watch battery or something like that. And uh, you use one of those, slip it into this adapter, which has enough room to hold it because these batteries were so big, slide it in your camera, and everything works fine. Um, but the thing about this camera is, again, you don't, the only reason the battery is there is for the meter. So you can use uh, the, the whole camera, the, the shutter speeds, the apertures, all of that, and trip the shutter without a battery. So if it's a huge issue finding one of these battery adapters, then just run it, run it all manual with a external meter or something like that, or, um, you know, figure it out. But if you try to just find a battery that fits, all modern batteries are 1.5 volt. Um, most of the time that's going to screw your camera up. Sometimes it can actually screw your camera up and like hurt it. Most of the time though, it won't, it won't hurt your camera. It will just cause your meter readings to be like way off and unpredictable. So it's not like you can be like, Oh, I just always have to stop down two stops. Like it's a, It'll be an exponential kind of offness. So sometimes it might only be a little bit off. Sometimes it'll be a lot off. So um, you just really have to either get a battery adapter that just that just takes the voltage of your battery down, um, or you have to figure out some some other solution. But the battery adapter is the best way I know how to use them, and they're a little bit expensive. But you only have to you know I mean you just buy one and put it with the camera and you're done. I want to say I spent like thirty dollars on my battery adapter, but I can use it in several different cameras too, which is kind of nice. So. I mean, most of these old manual cameras, I'm never, like, running three or four of them at the same time. You know, I'll use one for a week or two, and then I'll use another one. So I have one of these adapters, and I can use it in three or four of my cameras, which is kind of nice. So that was a pretty good investment, especially when you buy a camera and you're not sure what kind of battery it uses, and then suddenly you're like, oh, crap, and then, you you know, but you already have the adapter for it, so it's not a huge deal. Okay, so that's the battery issue. Um... I want to talk a little bit more about focusing, but quickly I want to show you a cool feature of the Rally 35, um, and it's this back plate. So you see all the lens mechanism in there. You see the rails that the film runs along. Um, the film runs this way, which is odd, right? But the winder is over here, so it kind of makes sense. Um, so yeah, so kind of strange, right? But um, the cool thing is this film plate, right? So you run your film in, and then once it's once you started winding it, you push this over it, and instead of there being something on the back plate that kind of pushes up against it, there's this thing that folds down over it um, this way, which keeps the film really, really flat, um, which means that your pictures can, in theory, be sharper, which is cool, right? So um, it's nice to have that, that they considered that when they built the camera. So, all right, so that's that. Let's talk about focusing. So the most intimidating thing about this camera is the fact that it's scale focus, right? That's a huge, it's a huge pain in the butt. Like you're out taking pictures, you gotta just like decide how far something, how far something is away. So let's talk about focusing really quick. If I can get this thing put back together. There we go. Okay. So if you look here, You've got, let's get in close again. You've got your focusing ring, which is the front here. These side things don't move, so it's top and bottom. Um, you have feet on this side, if you're uh, American, basically, are the only people that use feet anymore. And then on the bottom, you have meters. So that's kind of cool. Um, I think there were some produced that were reversed, so when your camera is right side up, you have meters. And the bottom is feet, but um, mine is feet on the top, which is nice because I don't really know meters that well. So you have three feet, four, six, ten, twenty, and infinity. And then you have your depth field marks here. 
So how do you scale focus? Well, there's a couple different options that you have. You can use an external rangefinder if you want, but that kind of defeats the purpose of the camera, I think, because then you're carrying a bunch of other crap with you. And this camera has a built-in meter, so there's no reason to, you know, like if you're going to just carry a small camera around, carry a small camera around. You don't want to have to carry all that other stuff with you. So ditch the external rangefinder and learn to scale focus. The way that I've learned to do that is a couple different ways. So the first thing that you do is put your arm out all the way in front of you, straight out in front of your nose, and measure that distance. For the vast majority of us, it's around three feet or one meter. Um, once you get that accurately, though, like if you know, like, okay, to the tip of my pinky is exactly three feet, then you can very accurately do close-up work. Um, you just physically put your hand out to whatever you're measuring, and, you know, maybe instead of saying, like, oh, that looks like three feet and one inch and trying to adjust your lens, you just adjust your position so it's three feet exactly, and then you can accurately do it that way. The second kind of uh, in-between kind of thing is um, what where you're, you would hit if you fell down. So I know that I'm, a, you know, about five foot eight. And most people can accurately predict um, kind of where their head would fall if they fell down. So just imagine that you fall straight down and your head would hit. And that's, you know, five feet, six feet, however tall you are. Um, that's another really easy way to do it. The other thing is that if you're inside, a lot of things that are on the floor are measured in feet or you know, whatever, however many meters or whatever. So I know that if I'm in like a place with tiled floors, most tile is 12 inches. So I can measure distance that way. Then the other thing is just knowing generally the distances, what distances are. So um, if you just know that a certain amount of distance is 10 feet, if you just, you know, be in a situation where you see that 10 feet over and over and over again, you'll get used to it. And then the further things are away, the less precise you have to be because that's how all lenses work. Um, with the exception of maybe like super telephoto lenses, obviously. But um, generally, when you're working with any kind of, any kind of camera lens, uh, the further things away, the less precise you have to be when focusing because your depth of field gets deeper the further out you go. Which is why when you look at your lens up close and personal, you see... 20 feet to 10 feet is maybe half an inch. And 3 feet to 4 feet, so this is 10 feet covered right here. It's 10 to 20, that's 10 feet. 3 feet to 4 feet, that's 1 foot, is covered over maybe twice that distance. So um, the further away you get, the less precise you have to be with your focusing. And if you're shooting landscapes or anything past 20 feet, which isn't really that far, you just pop it on infinity, and you're done. So uh, it's just a kind of an important thing to remember when you're, you're using this camera. The other thing that I've noticed about this camera is that the meter does not work well in low light. Um, that's why it's not working in this room right now, and that's just generally a limitation that it has. So uh, the meter just doesn't go that low. So what I normally do is reserve this camera for outdoor shooting or shooting in really bright places. Okay, so we've talked about the focusing, we've talked about uh, the limitations of the meter, um, how did the weird hot you, all this stuff. So quickly, I just want to run through all the buttons and knobs. We've covered most of them, but I just want to go through them all just to kind of uh, give you a general overview all in one place. So first things first, top plate, uh, where we normally start. Uh, you have the uh, advanced lever, film winding lever. You have the shutter over here. Uh, it has a standard threaded cable release, uh, which is really nice. If you have a normal cable release, you can just pop it in there. You have the meter, and you have the button to uh, release the lens, or to uh, yeah, to release the lens, so you can collapse it into the body. Um, you don't need to push it to pull it out. It just pulls out automatically, like I mentioned earlier. Um, so let's move it around to the front. So on the front, you have the meter right here. You have the viewfinder right here. Um, you have a couple things on the front here. You have the uh, f-stops over here, right there. You have the shutter speeds over here, again, to move the f-stops. To open up the aperture, you have to push in this button on the bottom and slide it 
Um, otherwise, it just won't go. So you have to push that in and then move it. Um, not a huge deal. What I haven't mentioned already is the ISO. The ISO is controlled, let's get this in focus, right here. So it has DIN, which is really weird and old school, but it has the app, the normal ISOs here from 25 to 1600. Um, you just grab these two little knobs right here, this black disc in the middle, and rotate it. Oops, so that rotated the whole thing. So you just rotate it like that. So Make sure the ASA button, which is the same as ISO, uh, is moving, and you're good to go. Okay, so that's the ISO. Um, you have the focusing here, you have the lens obviously, uh, and then this over on this side, this inner circle here, which also turns, um, is just to remind you what kind of film you have in the camera. You have a uh, tungsten color, which is um, color positive, so tungsten balanced chrome, um, daylight balanced chrome, uh, black and white negative, and then color negative. So um, if you use a lot of different films and you want to use this reminder, that's fine. Um, okay, so sides, nothing really there. Um, you have this weird strap, wrist strap here, which um, is really not easy to get in and out, but you kind of push those down and slide it out. And, um, so you have to use dedicated stuff for this because um, the mount is kind of weird. Going to the back. Uh, okay, so you have the advance again here. You have this here, which doesn't really do anything, I think. I think it may adjust the meter to calibrate it, but I've never, ever touched that, so I don't worry about it. You have the viewfinder. You have no information inside the viewfinder. On the later models, the SE and the TE, and then on some of the basic models, uh, those beginner models, um, you have uh, the meter information in there. This is the rewind release. Um, like on most cameras, have it a, as a button on the bottom. The Zorky had it as a collar around the... Um, around the shutter release, this is here. So when you're done with this and it won't advance anymore, um, you know, it's stuck, you're done at the end of the roll, you push this up. So see how it moves? So you push this up, and then you're able to rewind the film. So we'll move that down for now. So let's go to the bottom. Um, so let's see. Hot shoe right here. You have your um, release for the back, slides in and out here, so out means that the back can come off. Um, so there we go, like that. It's kind of tricky to get back on, guys, so just be a little careful with it. Um, so over here, this is your tripod mount, but around it, let's see if we can get this to work. You can see, let's get this in focus. That is your frame counter. Okay, so, and then over here is a really kind of ingenious way to rewind the film. So, you, uh, you know, you're at the end of your roll or whatever, you push this up, and then you pull this out. Okay, see how it comes out? And then, uh, if you rotate it enough, it will eventually fall into, let's see if we can make it, make it happen without filming it, it will fall into these, this slot right here. So see how that tab goes in that slot? And then you can just rewind your film. And then you'll hear it click, click, click. And then you come back around here, drop it into that hole. There's a little hole for the knob there. Okay? And then you're good to go again. And then you can put the new film in, push this down before you put your new film in, and you're good to go. So that's all the buttons and knobs and the action of the camera, how it works. So... Um, you do have to leave it cocked to drop it down and store it, but that's the only really kind of weird thing about it um, that a lot of purists might find annoying. So overall, I love my Raleigh 35. Um, I think in these videos, for the cameras that I've shot extensively, I want to show a few pictures from the, uh, from the camera. If you're desperately interested in seeing pictures that I've shot, you can go to my website, ckpj.com. That's C as in Cameron, K as in Knight, P as in Photo, and J as in Journalist.com. Um, I believe it's in my profile, but whatever. You can see some pictures that I've taken there. Uh, but you can also go to my Flickr page, 
which is a lot less uh, organized, and I don't really promote that. But I will. I'm going to show you a few pictures that I've shot using the Raleigh 35. So all the pictures I'm going to show you today were shot with Kodak UC100 film. It is a 100 speed film that's no longer made. UC stands for ultra color. Um, Nikon used to make NC film, which is neutral color, and then VC film, which is vivid color, and then they made their UC film, which was like an even more saturated -y kind of look. Um, these are all scans, so obviously I just adjusted the saturation to my own needs. I wasn't too worried about what it came with, but I did really like um, Kodak UC100. Um, the kind of replacement for that film now is Ektar 100, which I shoot a lot of now and is a really great film. So this first photo I shot in a kind of a restaurant. I was there. I really like the composition of it. I like the way the highlights blow out. Um, it's not like a digital camera. The highlights don't just like get all crazy. Um, they really kind of naturally blow out, which is w one of the reasons why I like film so much. Um, and also the, the huge amount of latitude I have in this photo. Um, I could have even brought the windows in more, but I just didn't. So um, I just like the composition and the fact that I was able to get decent color out of the, the shadows pretty well. Um, obviously, I exposed for them, but, um, you know, the lighting is super flat, but I was able to get good contrast out of it. Um, so this next photo here is uh, some leaves, kind of, you know, dead fall leaves from a vine on a wall. And... Um, you can see this, uh, this is, you can tell that it's a cloudy day, but you still get really interesting color, um, very accurate color, I feel, for a day like this. Um, a lot of times it will just wash out and look pretty gross, but pretty good color out of it. Um, you can see that this is a pretty close-up shot. I mean, we're talking maybe six or seven feet away, um, but again, it just looks super sharp. Scale focusing, um, regardless of how bad you think you're going to be at it, it's not as hard as you think. Um, it's... I just was shocked at how many photos I had in focus um, my first time out with this camera. These shots are not for my first time out, but even the first time out with the camera, I was really, really surprised at how many shots I got in focus. Um, it's just, it's not as hard as you think it is, so don't let it scare you. So this next shot is, uh, you can see just kind of a pattern shot with three trash cans, all with the number three on them. Um, a lot of the, the place where I was living at the time you would label your trash can so when they all got mixed up because you're at an, in an apartment with your own but you have your own trash cans um they would get all mixed up but you'd be able to find them because you'd have your number on them or whatever um so just kind of a repetitive shot but again nice really sharp lines really in focus picture which again is just it always kind of surprises me how good i am at scale focusing but i just don't think it's that hard and i think that the lens uh, the tesser lens specifically is really forgiving so this next shot is sort of a, whatever, an abstract, I guess, of a water fountain, a dirty water fountain. Um, but I was just trying to work with the graphic lines. But again, this is, I just I wanted to show you this one because I was standing on like a wall that was the, the height of the water fountain. So it was really easy to get it in focus. Like, I just know how tall I am. So I just, you know, said I'm five, five and a half feet. I put it between five and six and I was, I was good to go. So it, it's super sharp. You can tell that there's a lot of detail in here in the middle of the water fountain that got in focus. But if you look carefully, you can tell I'm not back focused. The background is a little bit soft, but not a lot, not a lot soft. So even if you're quite a bit off, it's still not bad. Um, it's, and it's, I think it's that slightly wide angle nature of the lens. That 40 millimeter lens um, has a little bit of wide angle properties to it. So it gives you a little bit deeper depth of field than you expect it than you expect it to. This is a, this is one of my favorite shots I did, kind of a street photography shot with a, you know, a little girl dressed up in her coat fighting with the rain. I love the color of the fire hydrant and the color of her scarf. I think they're just two really bright spots in this pretty dreary photo. Um, this was taken kind of from the hip, so that's why she's sort of in the edge of the frame. Um, but I think it, it worked out pretty well. Um, and I lied, I'm gonna show you one more picture, another one of my favorites from this, series that I shot and it's this one of uh of just kind of a farmhouse I love this picture I have a print of it on my wall at home um again really good detail really cool color I love the blues um obviously I could get rid of those if I wanted to um but I just I like them blue like that 
there are some true whites, so it doesn't look too funky and weird, but I just really love the blues, and then the contrast of this the one single window that's, you know, lit by a tungsten light and really orange. I just love this picture. Um, it's just, I'm, I'm a photojournalist, so I work really hard to take these, like, still life, landscape -y type type of shots, and I usually fail miserably at it, but um, this one I just, I just really like a lot. I love the the highlight along this like farm silo thing. I love the chicken coop, whatever this is. I don't really know what this is, but um, you know, just the detail of it. The tracks in the snow, I really like. I love the color, the sharpness, everything about it I really like. So I'm gonna go ahead and end on that. So this is your camera overview of the Raleigh 35, a great compact camera that's really fun to use. It's super quirky. And it's just um, one of my favorites, for sure. So uh, if you're interested, you can buy these on KEH or eBay or whatever. Again, they're not the cheapest camera. They have a, a lot of following with collectors and also shooters. Um, but it's a, they're a blast to use. And if you can get your hands on one, do it. Even if it's the cheaper versions, like the, the LED version, there's a Raleigh 35 LED or the B, the Raleigh 35B, or the Raleigh 35C. Um, those are all of the like weirder um, beginner versions. So um, you can check those out uh, if you can get your hands on them. And they are a little bit cheaper. And the Singapore ones are, are cheaper too. So take a look at them. If you love them, um, you'll love them. So it's just a weird, quirky camera that's really fun to shoot with. And if you do shoot with one, you will end up really liking it. So again, uh, catchphrase is uh, keep shooting. So get out there, take a lot of pictures. Again, guys, uh, I'm not getting a ton of comments on these videos. I'm getting a lot of views, which I'm happy with, but I'm not getting a ton of comments. So if there's a camera out there that you want to get an in-depth look at, uh, there's pretty good chance that I have it. You've also seen a lot of cameras in these videos that I just kind of flash in and flash out. So if there's any of those that you want a really good look at or you want to check out, um, you want me to tell you about, let me know, let me know. And even if there's a camera that's, if it's not super expensive and I don't have it, I'll, I'll buy it and, and uh, use it for a little while and eventually put out a video about it. So please guys, if you, if there's a camera you want to look at, just let me know. I think if I don't hear back from you guys about any cameras that you'd like to see, um, I may do the Olympus XA or I may do a, a folding camera of some sort. So, um, just let me know if there's something out there you want to see. So Thanks, guys. Keep shooting, and uh, I hope you enjoyed the video. See you next time. Bye.